Okay, we left off talking about carrier transport, and uh, I had mentioned that carrier transports, uh, solutes, they very quickly, but eventually the carrier system is going to saturate. And what that means is we're going to get to a point where we can no longer increase the number of molecules that we're moving in a given unit of time. And the reason this happens is carriers respond to increases in solute number. So this is a concentration increase in solutes by carrying more of those solutes. And so they have an increase in transport rate. But this increase in transport rate is not infinite. It does not fall in uh, level of infinity. It's actually going to reach a maximum. And that point of saturation or that maximum is referred to as the solutes and the carrier's transport maximum. And this variable is referred to as the carrier's TM. Okay, so we actually are going to find that there are three types of carriers. Those three types of carriers are going to include uniport carriers. And these uniport carriers, as the name refers to, it's just uni or single. So just one single solute in one direction. In other words, we may transport sodium and only sodium, no other types of solutes and only from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid, just in that one direction. A second type of carrier transport mechanism we have is called a symport. And symports are going to co-transport, meaning that there is going to be two or more individual solutes. So this may be sodium and potassium, but it's a symport and it's a co-transport mechanism, meaning in the same direction. So both solutes or all of the solutes involved are going in that single direction, both either into the cell or both out of the cell. Our last and final mechanism are going to be the antiports. And the antiports are going to follow a counter transport mechanism. And again, we're going to see two or more individual solutes, but these two or more individual solutes are going to go in opposite directions. So we may have sodium enter into the cell and potassium exit the cell through the same carrier transport protein. Now, alongside these three types of carriers, there's going to be three mechanisms by which these three types of car uh, carriers can work. Okay, so three mechanisms of carrier transport. The first of these three types of mechanisms is a mechanism known as facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion. Now, we're familiar with diffusion already, and we're actually familiar with the concept of facilitated. Facilitated just means that there's going to be something that aids or helps to support this process. And diffusion is just simply the movement of a solute down its concentration gradient. So the facilitated is because the carrier itself, the protein, is going to act to increase membrane permeability. The diffusion will be the solute 
traveling down its concentration gradient. So the carrier itself is what is facilitating the movement of a solute down its concentration gradient through the membrane or through a barrier. Now facilitated diffusion, just like simple diffusion, is going to be passive. Because we're utilizing a concentration gradient, we do not require energy from ATP. So we have no energy required. Typically, the facilitated diffusion mechanism, we're going to see the, meat, the carrier transport protein bound in the membrane sitting open. As it sits open, there is an active site that's exposed. That active spot site is going to be able to bind to a solute. In this case, it's going to be, I'm sorry, it's going to bind to a ligand, and in this case, it'll be specifically a solute. So the ligand binds to that active site, and whenever we bind something, to a protein, that protein is caused to have a conformational switch. So this protein is going to reconfigure. So the channel reconfigures. Now as the channel reconfigures and the protein reorganizes itself, the ligand is going to be moved through and released on the other side of the membrane. Again, always diffusing down the concentration gradient. A second mechanism of carrier transport is going to be primary active transport. And primary active transport, as you can see here, is going to be primary and active because it's going to be moving one particle against its concentration gradient requiring energy. So we have movement of a solute particle against, sometimes also referred to as up, the concentration gradient. So we're going against or we're going up the concentration gradient. And because we're going up the concentration gradient, this is much like moving water up a hill. We're going to either need to physically move it ourselves or we're going to need some type of pump. Both of those uh, examples are going to require energy. We're also going to require energy here to overcome that concentration gradient that we're working against. So to get that energy, we are going to use ATP. Adenosine triphosphate is going to be hydrolyzed. And hydrolysis, or hydrolyzing a molecule, just simply means that we're going to take water and we're going to break something with that water molecule. So we're going to use the bonds held in water to break apart ATP. And as we break bonds, we are going to liberate energy that then can be used for useful work, such as moving the solute against its concentration gradient. So that hydrolysis is going to supply the carrier with the energy. And really, it's transferring a phosphate group from the ATP to a new bond with the carrier. And in doing so, we cause a conformational switch to happen in which we can move the solute to another location. And it's either pushed or could be referred to as pumped into a more concentrated area. One of the best examples that we can give here of a primary active transport mechanism, and it's actually going to be a anti-port mechanism, is going to be a sodium-potassium pump. In fact, the term pump, whenever you see that, you should recognize that this is going to be a primary active transport mechanism. So we're moving sodium and potassium. These are our two solutes. So this is a uh, 
anti-port mechanism, sodium's going in one direction, potassium's going in the other direction, and we're pumping these two solutes against their concentration gradients, sodium outside of the cell, potassium into the cell across the membrane. And we're constantly doing this to help maintain many of the membranes and the electrolyte composition around those membranes so that when we need to use muscles and nerves in our cardiac tissue, it's going to be fully charged and ready for utilization. So this accounts for about 50% of the calories that you are going to burn on a daily basis. And so you may have heard before, yes, we burn 2,000 calories, and those 2,000 calories that we utilize or that we burn on a daily basis goes towards, 1,000 of them go towards making sure that the sodium potassium pumps are fully utilized. So it's the ATP component that's being uh, produced to fuel the sodium potassium pump that accounts for about 50% of that calorie utilization each day. Now this 50%, what do we need? What are some of the things that we do that require all of this caloric intake and all of this ATP production? Well, primary active transport is going to be the primary supporter of another mechanism of transport called secondary active transport. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. The sodium potassium pump is also an important regulator of cell volume. And in regulating cell volume, we can be sure that the inside of the cell is negatively charged, which is going to be very important. But because the inside of the cell is constantly negatively charged, this attracts or pulls in positively charged solutes and molecules. So there's big negative charge inside of the cell attracts positively charged molecules called cations. And they get moved into the cell. Well, these cations are matter. They have mass and they take up space. And so what that means is, is more of these cations are drawn into the cell, there's less room for water. Now, because there's less room for water, that means that we begin to set up a concentration gradient that favors water to move from its high concentration to a low concentration. We're consuming space inside the cell, lower water concentration. Water is going to favorably move into the cell. So if we didn't regulate this mechanism, we would have water that would just continually enter the cell. So the water would follow those cations via osmosis, just a special form of diffusion reserved for water. But as this happens, as more water enters through osmosis, the cell begins to fill up and eventually it can lutz or break apart. So we want to prevent that. So sodium potassium pumps, we pump out three sodiums for every two potassiums that are pumped in. That's a net of one positively charged or one cation that's lost each cycle of the pump. And so we're beginning to manage the number of positive ions that move into the cell, allowing less water to follow. So by pumping those cations out of the cell, this reduces the influx of water following those cations. Now, in addition to regulating cell volume and being the primary supporter of active transport, the sodium potassium pump maintains what's known as resting membrane potentials, or RMPs, resting membrane potentials. Cells need to respond to stimuli, and in order for them to respond to stimuli, they need to be set at a resting membrane potential 
that mimics or resembles poles of a battery. So just like a battery always needs to be charged, a cell always needs to be charged as well, and we call that charge the resting membrane potential. Lastly, the sodium potassium pump, this primary active transport mechanism, is heavily involved in the regulation of heat. And specifically, it's, regu it's regulating heat production. Every time there's a chemical reaction, you know that there's some useful work that occurs, but there's also a generation of heat. And some of that heat is going to dissipate into the surroundings. That surroundings, in the case of human physiology, is going to be human body tissue. So in order to increase heat, we can increase the number or the effectiveness of the sodium potassium pump. Sweating and perspiration would be the opposite here. This would help us to dissipate heat into the environment to help keep uh, the body from overheating or from an organism from having too much heat. But we also need to have gains in heat. We're gaining those from the chemical reactions that are occurring through the use of the sodium potassium pump and the hydrolysis of an ATP molecule. Uh, the thyroid, which is an endocrine organ produces thyroid hormones. And thyroid hormones are going to cause cells to produce sodium potassium pumps. So if we need an increase in heat production, the thyroid will begin to produce thyroid hormones, causing an increase in the presence of sodium potassium pumps. As we increase the number of sodium potassium pumps, we have an increase in ATP uh, that is being utilized by the sodium potassium pump. That chemical reaction produces useful work by breaking apart the ATP molecule, but also produces a little bit of heat. So we have an increase in heat that's being produced. And this is the one side of the equation, heat production, to help out with temperature balance. So primary active transport ends up being a very important mechanism of transport, not only because we're moving solutes across the membrane, but for a variety of other downstream reasons, such as supporting secondary active transport, cell volume regulation, maintaining the resting membrane potential, and also heat production. All right, our third and final mechanism of carrier transport, as I've already alluded to, is going to be secondary active transport. And as you can see in this figure here, we're going to have our sodium potassium pump. And that sodium potassium pump, a primary active transport mechanism, is going to be coupled to a sodium glucose symport transport mechanism that allows sodium to be crossed or moved through the membrane, and glucose is going to piggyback onto that movement so that we can increase glucose inside of the cell through this sodium glucose symporter. So we use the primary active transport to create a concentration gradient of sodium favoring sodium movement into the cell, and as sodium moves back across into the cell, glucose is going to go along for the ride. So as you look at this mechanism, you can see that I have a combination of facilitated diffusion and primary active transport. So here's my facilitated diffusion mechanism where we have sodium, a small molecule diffusing down its concentration gradient, pulling glucose, a larger molecule, down its concentration gradient, facilitating that process. And then our active transport mechanism of the sodium potassium pump. So the pump transports solute against a concentration gradient or down, or uh, excuse me, up its concentration gradient. This lowers the cell concentration of the solute. So for example, the sodium potassium pump, 
pushes sodium outside of the cell. It's now lower inside of the cell, favoring diffusive movement or diffusion of sodium into the cell. The facilitated diffusion mechanism here, the sodium glucose symporter, we then have two solutes, the sodium and the glucose, that are allowed to or able to enter the cell through this particular carrier following the sodium concentration gradient. So sodium travels down its concentration gradient and glucose piggybacks on and is able to cross through the membrane. Now, up to this point, we've discussed single molecule transport, and we've discussed transport across the cell membrane. This could also, in a lot of cases, be applied to the membranes that we find around organelles inside of eukaryotic cells, such as the Golgi complex of the endoplasmic reticulum or the nucleus. But there's also a system of transport for vesicles, and we call that this vesicle or vesicular trafficking in the cell. Now, you can find a little more detail on this in Table 3.3 inside of the book for a really good summary. But vesicle trafficking inside of the cell is not focused on individual molecules crossing the cell, such as you know one or two or three molecules being tr crossed through a, a uh, transporter. But rather, we're dealing with large amounts of material. So we're going to be moving large quantities or amounts all at one time. We would call this bulk transport. So we're moving materials in bulk. And there are mechanisms that move large amounts of material through the membrane in both directions. So from inside the membrane to outside the membrane or from outside the membrane to the inside of the cell. And then there's also mechanisms of transport where we are moving material through the cell from one side of the cell to the other. So into the cell, the secular transport or bulk transport is known as endocytosis. And the way that I try to remember this is ENDO, kind of looks like IN2. So this is going to be endocytosis, this is into the cell. And there are three types of endocytosis that we can identify. So three ways in which large amounts of material packaged up into a vesicle, which is just simply going to be a packet of lipids. So this is a membrane-like membrane, membrane -like uh, surrounding and then a bunch of stuff inside of that vesicle. The three types, one is going to be phagocytosis. This here, if you're up on your Latin, means to eat and we eat solid food. So this is going to be a transport mechanism where we are moving solids across the cell membrane. And so this may be um, solid things like glucose or larger uh, storage molecules. The second type is pinocytosis. And pino, P-I-N-O, means to drink. And so this is going to be for liquids. And so here you should think more in terms of solution will have a vesicle that's formed by the cell membrane itself kind of reaching out and grabbing onto some of the extracellular fluid as a solution to pull it into the cell. The last type is a very specific type of bulk transport. It involves a protein called a receptor, and so it's going to be receptor-mediated endocytosis. So again, moving material into the cell, 
the receptor is going to be a protein that we find inside of that lipid bilayer that makes up the vesicle. And that receptor is going to bind specific molecules. So maybe this is some sort of amino acid. And we need that specific amino acid and so the inside of a cell. And so that particular cell will express a receptor that is specific for the amino acid that's required. Then we go ahead and grab onto all of those specific molecules and we can bring that vesicle inside the membrane invaginates and pulls in that material. Okay, so all three of those are to bring material in. We have one mechanism to bring stuff out, and this is called exocytosis. Here, too, I got a little trick. This kind of looks like exit. Exocytosis is to bring stuff out of the cell. And there's just one type of exocytosis. So the three types of endocytosis, the single type of exocytosis, and then we have transcytosis. And transcytosis is going to be from one side of a cell to the other. Or in other words, we're going to transport through the cell. So this is bulk materials to get packaged up into a vesicle and then get moved through the vesicle to the other side. Now inside of the cell, you know, we may have the membrane out here and then we may have these vesicles, lipid bilayers containing a bunch of stuff, and we have to move that vesicle from here to here and then we can release it out of the cell, get rid of the material out of the cell. The vesicle is actually going to be involved in a transport mechanism. So how do we move these vesicles around the cell? We use this mechanism known as vesicular transport. And vesicular transport requires motor proteins that catalyze ATP, so they got to gain energy, so we got to require ATP, and those motor proteins have the ability to hold on to the vesicle and then to move along the cytoskeleton and to facilitate that movement back up towards the cell membrane. And so these motor proteins are going to shuttle the vesicles. So the vesicle is just the packet and then these motor proteins involved in vesicular transport are sort of like the delivery guys. And these delivery guys use the cytoskeleton as the conduit to move. So kind of like little tiny tightrope walkers. 